All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun. Back to talk more Fall of the House of Usher. Uh, it has been really awesome watching uh, and talking about the first two episodes. And we are on episode three. It is called Murder in the Rue Morgue. And uh, if you're liking this channel and liking what we do here, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, notifications, all that stuff. Uh, first thing I have to talk about for this week, for this episode, <laughs> and is to make a damn huge correction from like the previous ways I was talking about this. This in this episode, I finally realized that, and for anybody who watched the other ones and was like, "What the hell is he talking about?" That's not correct. Uh, I thought that Willa Fitzgerald and Mary McDonald's character. Uh, was the wife or like ex-wife of, of Roderick's. I had, I didn't know until this, this episode that they were brother and sister. I just, for some reason did not catch that. So I've been talking about their relationship as if they were together. And in a lot of ways, I guess one of the reasons I felt that way is because of how close they are. There was this other woman in the room with a bit, you know what I mean? Like, I actually thought, like, I don't know, like that. I don't know why I wasn't clued in when I, I know there was another scene prior where they were together, all three of them. And I thought maybe the other one was his sister. Yeah, that's what it was. I don't know why. It's so weird, but I apologize to anybody who was confused by that, like part of the the video. So you know, I, everybody misses <laughs> the best people that talk about anything, man, can still miss something right in front of their faces. So you know, I catching it now, I'm like, ugh, woof. Um, but murder in the room org. Look, I love all. The, I've loved all this. I, I like. I even love this episode. But my only complaint would be that, um. We had the setup episode, which is the first one, and then we proceed with for the next six episodes to have them, you know, each kid bite it in some fashion. Now, the first, the second episode, really, there was an ensemble quality to it. It was still following the story. They want to like pat, you know, that's if you're going to pat out your your story, Mike Flanagan is great with, you know building the world in between that needs to to be there for the way that he's making this story. So I don't, you know, like, I don't know, it, it, but it was still Prospero's story. He was all over it. Like he really, it really still felt like his episode. This one does not really feel like Camille's episode to me. She's in it, but there was, there was a lot more of setting up, like the fourth episode, uh, and actually there was a lot of setup for the uh, like a lot of the other the next episodes. So for Victorine, and um, for let's see where is her name here? Um, because I had everything. She was oh, I have two pages of notes, so that I gotta like look through all of them now. <laughs> <laughs> but Tamara's Lane, they're setting up Tamara's Lane's episode. They're setting up Victorine's episode. They're setting up Leo's episode in this episode. And I was kind of like, I don't know. I felt like that kind of like all the ways that they didn't really need to do that. I, I really wish they hadn't set it up because all it really is going to do is then they'll kind of replay these moments a little bit to just show them connecting. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just story wise. I wish that it would have kept out a little less of some of the things that didn't really need to be in this episode to me, just the way it's structured, like the, in, in, and I'll even like, I'll mention the scene now just so we can put that in with what I'm talking about. But like is as much as it was like creepy and, and terrifying spoil full spoilers, by the way, um, the fact that when they put, um, Freddie's wife, um, who is in the hospital being the, like survivor of the whole Prospero incident. Well, that answers the question of where she was. Uh, <laughs> she never got out of there. Um, but when she wakes up and she's taking off her bandages, it's a, it's a horrifying, scary, tense scene. That's like, you know, it's, it's great. 
you know, oh, it just is like, no, please don't do that. Like, where are the doctors? Where are the fucking nurses? But it really didn't need to be here. It's all I'm saying. I, I don't know. Like, but again, it's still great. I just, everything, I, can't, I keep thinking about like everything taking away from uh, the power of Camille's death. Like, the, the st her, her like story, you know, even if she's not a likable character, you know, like, I want to see the depths. You know, like I want to, I wanted to see more of, you know, like not to, con you know, not to pile on the fact that, you know, she's an unsympathetic character. So I want to keep feeling more and more unsympathetic, so that when she bites it, you know, it really feels justified. You know, it really feels satisfying to the viewer to watch somebody like this, you know, get theirs. Because I mean, let's face it, part of like one of the reasons why this is good is because there is a bit of like satisfaction in seeing this kind of person get taken down it's just a flaw in our <laughs> in a lot of us you know but you know since we can't see that since this doesn't happen in the real world this is our you know sick little <laughs> fantasy world and and mike flanagan is is uh you know writing it up for us and i want to thank you mike for making this show i really do because this is for our, all of us down here at street level <laughs> as the people up there in this show you know find themselves on the wrong end of things eventually finally um <laughs> but yeah I, I really wanted this to show like more of camille like because she's interesting even if she's a terrible person like she's really messed up and i really wanted to like talk about like in the end like Kind of, especially after, like, the very end of this, her reaction to things, the, re the reaction to her fate. Her blasé attitude at the end was, like, but not, you know what I mean, like, acceptance or whatever. But I wanted to see, like, how she could, you know, like, because of her, like, again, I don't want to spoil the ending yet, but, like, there was potential for a lot more for her. And... It just felt like she got a little bit shortchanged. And I'm not saying that she's not going to be all over the other episodes. I'm sure that they'll figure out ways to still weave her in connectively. But Prospero wasn't in this episode other than either him in makeup or just, uh, you know what I mean, or in spirit. <laughs> because I don't know if that was the actor laying on the floor at the beginning of this. Um, but other than that, again, really, really good this episode has again some of the best writing I've had. I, I just from a writing standpoint and dialogue standpoint, and uh, this is like this is better call saw level. You know, this is great. This is I can't. So let's just get into this because I love how this is also bookended. Like it starts with screaming chimps, like screaming chimps, right? Just enraged, and then at the end, over the credits. It's chimp noises, but they're not screaming anymore. Like, the rage has been let out. And in a way, I guess, what we were hearing at the beginning was, you know, the death of this person. <laughs> in some ways, we want to look at it like that. Um, but I loved this beginning scene. Because, again, this speaks to, like, power, privilege, and where those things can get you, you know, and how when you have enough money nothing basically nothing is you know impossible to cover up i mean these cops that see you know arthur pym uh played by mark hamill again just do it is hey, everybody get out of my way it's almost uh, <laughs> almost started doing beetlejuice which i you know what just really side note i actually am just i'm morbidly curious about what beetlejuice 2 is gonna be like but um I'm not predicting that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this would have to feel like that movie maybe uh, came out a lot 30 years too late. Mm -hmm. That was like Beetlejuice and like freaking <laughs> Sling Blade. <laughs> but anyway, um, Arthur Pym getting past like the cops, then they just go, I don't know how, but apparently he's fine. And you know, I like the thinking of, of, like, of like this. Is that not only did that cop have to take that call, but he probably also had to be told, 
<clears throat> I don't have to tell you this, but if you say that you saw this person, you know, you're in deep shit. You know what I'm saying? Like these people, like in the collateral, the potential for collateral damage that these people just don't give a shit about. Like these guys are there doing their job. This guy shows up to cover something up to investigate on his own. He is not a he is not affiliated with law enforcement. He is just a lawyer who has connections because of Roderick that can get them can, can open any door but when those people move through our lives we are just swatted away if we talk about what they've been up to and it's just that's what i thought about in this scene and it just before he got inside after he gets inside <clears throat> that's a whole other story i loved this I loved the way that they filmed this, the way they, it was all dark and you can just hear the dripping and just the unease and the way that the, the flashlight goes over these, just this gruesome, gruesome scene. And him take, you know, finding the mask, finding Prospero, taking his phone and, and this being where we find out that Freddie's wife is still alive. Now, I didn't know that was Freddie's wife, but I should have known right away that that would have been, like, story-wise, plot-wise. It, it, it's, you know, it's great because, you know, the way she reaches out and grabs him. And again, jump scare. Guess what? But it's for, it actually has a scare. Somebody's actually there. It's something actually happening, and it's not some ghost going, poo. Um, and this is, okay, this is where, we, okay, so we go from this really great, gruesome, you know, scene of, covering up a you know already working at covering up a crime scene where 78 are dead 70 and, and, and i probably should course correct on this a little bit too i don't think that there were like when i was saying there's a lot of like celebrities and other shit in there now there was a lot of people like connected to people who could be blackmailed could have been blackmailed uh over the footage like somebody that somebody else knows do you know what I'm saying like somebody will be like it'd be a shame if this person's blah 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 were to get out um being like prospero's ultimate goal for this place even working but when this scene again bruce greenwood give, give the emmy nominations for best actor in a limited series or whatever however they do hand out the awards or nominations because i honestly don't give a shit too much about awards but um, I keep, I say this about like, oh, every Mike Flanagan thing probably. Um, but I definitely think that Bruce Greenwood needs to be nominated because his ability to just like a man who is damned, he's playing a man who's damned and he knows it. And this confession is just, I mean, it's great story wise, but it's, he's unburdening himself to the one person who wants the information the most he's got nothing to lose he knows like this is probably his like last night on earth and and who knows maybe he thinks that maybe it's true maybe it's going to happen maybe both of these men maybe neither of them are walking out of this room so <clears throat> his just like complete honesty is the way he does it, it the way he just all the words just come efforts effortlessly out of his mouth like they've always been waiting to come out they've always been right there on the surface just ready to spew out because of the the level of detail that he has you know like knowing about every bit of the problem with why this happened to prospero and that you know, he, he knew all the details about it. he repurposed the, I mean, at time had gone by, so I'm sure they had enough time to investigate properly. But knowing that, like, it was their medical byproduct that was so acidic, they couldn't even, they didn't even know what to do with it. It couldn't even be moved. It couldn't be, it was just so horrible. So that's what happened to those people. It was acid. It wasn't just hot water from, like, a hot tub. <laughs> 
but um and just the way he's just like medical byproduct highly acidic less than legal process well, i mean he just says every single illegal thing that they did and it's just like breathing he literally figured out a way to and i've, I've seen you know like they they say like people that lie like breathing right so we've seen plenty of people in we see this every day in our lives people that just lie like every <laughs> my like it's breathing but telling the truth like it's breathing is rare rarer i think at least to be able to see it you know what i mean to have like to bear witness to it to have proof that it exists and like here it's like it, it, he's telling the absolute absolute truth he's leaving nothing out he might be a little hypocritical in this episode at times because he's uh, you know he's upset you know increasingly getting upset because of what he's seeing <clears throat> but uh just his performance you know just fantastic in this scene now they've already now they and again quickly they've moved on this so quickly that they already know that the staff left that they know that so they're looking for like this is somebody did this to us um because they don't have the information probably completely yet um that prospero didn't do this himself yeah you know, which was what happened but it was all kind of nudged there a little bit well Actually, I think I, I actually do think a little bit like Prospero's death could have been <laughs> actually. <laughs> but as we see by this, uh, there's a moment where I thought one thing was happening and another thing happened. And it, it's all these people were going to die. It was just a matter of how or when. Like, it, it, as far as Vern is con concerned. <clears throat> all right. So they plan on blaming a guest, but they want Camille to be 10 miles away from it. They don't want her. PR, you know, she handles public relations. They don't want her anywhere near this. Um, and so I thought that that was going to be the beginning of it. Like, okay, we're going to have Camille now basically trying to figure out, like, expose things. Like, but the thing is, is like, she's, she only wants the information so that she can twist it, you know, to their advantage. And it's, you know, it's not about like, oh, we actually care about like being scumbags. It's just, that she's also like she's a danger at the same time which is kind of weird because the way she handles it is not the way that they want to handle it basically you know she's gonna try to like make it a big thing and and it and she ends up doing that and i mean it's great how she comes up with this idea um because she automatically is all about making that Prospero's death like this preventable death and that this would strum up public, you know, sympathy. And it's just, again, like, it's just so easy. She just, like, well, again, like how he is breathing the truth in one season, in one scene, and she's lying, like, breathing in the next. And I mean, they learned it from the best. Or maybe they already had it in them, you know, they're, these characteristics. We don't get to, like, see their, too much of their upbringing. There's a lot of things alluded to uh, within their childhood. And maybe there will be, like, an episode where it discusses, like, the, you know, they're growing up a little bit. I don't know. Probably not. But, and, boy, I don't lose my train of thought here. But, yeah the 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 way that she just turns on the lies and it's just one just and if it's not a lie it's still like something that's just about manipulation manipulation of the public and it's again there's a there's another movie on netflix called don't look up that i know is a pretty probably it is a pretty you know good satire but I can't watch it because it's just too much like it it's too hits the nail too good on the head for me to where I'm like, yeah, I don't need to see something I already know. 
Like I'm not the audience <clears throat> as, as good as this is. I'm not the audience for this. I'm not the one who needs to hear this message. So watching something like that just kind of upsets me. Like it's, it's like purposely putting myself through, you know, like two hours of like everybody around me is an idiot or something, you know, about <laughs> certain things. Um, and in this too, it, it runs a little bit like it, it runs close to being like that, but it's just a, it because this is the you know a good uh, release for us little people to see the the assholes get taken down. Um, I think that's how it's easier to palette for myself, and that what too much one way or the other would probably be I would I probably wouldn't be enjoying this as much. Because as much as I, you know, despise them and like seeing them get taken down, there's also I love like understanding the character before they're, you know, taken out. So I appreciate them taking the time to like show like how just how like how not just how they see us, but like how they manipulate every kind of thing to to their own advantage. Now, the next scene where we have, and it's real quick, but it's Greenwood talking to, it's, it's Roderick talking to Freddie, and he, he basically blames his son that if he had taken care of this building, none of this would have happened. And, and this goes right to Roderick, like at, the, at its core, is that, yeah, his kids are to blame, but you did this. Like, it, he's not there. It's like what he says at the, you know, to, at the beginning of this. I'm the one to blame, but so far it's we're seeing this is not his take yet. Like he's blaming his children for his failures as a person, as a father, as you know, as a <laughs> as everything. Now we finally get a, a bit of Camille here, where she's talking, uh, she's watching Fox News, and she's like, she loves them, but at the same time, she hates them. And again, it's just more that we see from our own <clears throat> world is these people who you know could give a shit about Fox News. But if they, they know that if they go to Fox News with a certain kind of story, they know that it'll get play. <clears throat> and it's just, you know, what's worse, you know, like what's worse, believing in something or using something that you don't believe in? I don't know to manipulate things knowing all the while that you you can't stand them but you'll use them to get what you want and it's just oof. but we get to them finally talking about the the chimps that her whole gig right now and she's obsessed with it is uncovering what victorine is up to and this does get into like some sibling rivalry because you know there's a scene where her and leo were talking about them being the bastards you know, we're we're not from, you know, the main vein. Like we we are the ones that have we were the one night stands. Her and Leo and Prospero and I don't know if they're Victorine or not. But this whole thing that she's got with her because Victorine, well, she's actually doing something. Like there was that the conversation being that and again, a great conversation great dialogue is her telling leo you know we don't make shit like he's like i make video games man you know i don't i don't i don't get involved man i got a frog in my throat <laughs> i don't i don't get down with you guys doing all that you know i'm like video games she's like we don't make shit you pay people to make video games right i don't do anything i just move dirt around like I, I i'm not i'm nothing i'm just the person that like spins and spins and spins and i go nowhere but victorine you know she's actually doing something even if it's unethical and and and, and more than that depending on it's criminal it's and I, you know I, I don't know how much about like there's just certain things i don't know but they're covering up the results they're basically doing research on these chimps and when it doesn't work they just if one dies they just kind of 
take another one and pretend that it was that one and they're quietly just chopping up the monkeys and the die and, yeah and it is all just to keep things going because they know it'll work they know it'll work and you know even though victorine i think you know she doesn't i don't think she realizes what she's really doing is helping her old man you know stay alive which comes up like a lot of this and you know there's a good amount of stuff in here that talks about like with roderick and his past and 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 his sisters about you know what they were willing to do um to get things done like they're not like they have ideas like he came to this guy with an idea he's not making anything again like she says ushers don't make shit like he didn't make ligonone he just saw the idea and he took that idea to the guy and then the guy decided to screw him over because he doesn't realize he's like you can't you know an idea is an empty fart <laughs> and he just it's so it's really about uh, you you can have an idea but then you have to you have to do something about it you have to patent that idea you have to take that opportunity and if you don't take that opportunity someone else is going to and it you know for me this is all about like the doggy dog real nature of this world that like and how camille actually talks about later about being like you know you're not mad that um that i have it you you're mad that you don't have it so it's all about opportunities and that, and if you fail to do it someone's going to step in and and a lot of people don't i think like for my sake right I'll, I'll bring myself into this like if i see an opportunity and i don't take it and somebody else picks it up you know it can it stings to me personally like i'm i'm one of those people who dwells <laughs> i'm a i'm a dweller maybe that's what i should have wrote on here instead of pointlessly mean was dweller but it's true. I mean, we look at we look at so many things, and as much as I'd like to sit on on high and call myself some paragon of like, oh, I don't get like that. I fucking I do. I definitely did. I do it less now. I finally woke up, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still like some sort of nurse a little tiny narcissistic tendency, uh, ambitious side, and I've talked about it. You know, and if you don't take those opportunities and somebody else jumps on, we get pissed. And that's kind of like a lot of what happens, you know, like what they're talking about within this episode, at least. Um, Clem Pamela. So, like, Verna shows up like all over this right i mean they have her already in the pictures so she's in there that but like she shows up at uh uh victorine's uh well actually her i think it's her girlfriend's or wife's um place also tinia miller if i'm saying that right she i i failed to bring up before that she was also in of mike flanagan she was in by manor um i don't know why i missed how i missed that um so just another connection um, but she just shows up with her heart issues, like perfect candidate in the files, right? Perfect candidate in the files. <laughs> and it's like perfect. Like that. I mean, this is why I was a little annoyed, all right? Is them setting it up, like setting it up here. I, I don't know. I kind of almost feel like in the first episode, they, if they would have just knocked out like all, like she's here, she's there, she's everywhere. And then, then in the episodes where they die, we she shows up again i would have thought that would have been pretty cool but here it just is a little it takes away a little bit of the surprise to me maybe uh, but we'll see. again the episodes are i know they're the episodes are still going to be good i just feel like when i see a missed opportunity or an opportunity taken too early or something that could have been moved here or there i mean i think i'm just talking about editing really it's like but um she just shows up with the file that's like perfect like to be the perfect candidate for these people so it's like i already know where it's kind of going well what i don't understand and we'll talk about it in a little is is that her 
but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, okay, we got to get to the, the best life gives you lemon speech I think I've ever heard. I have to. I mean, because it's just that I don't think I've ever heard a life gives you lemon speech, right? Maybe once or twice somewhere. Maybe once really famously, and I'm trying to remember what. <clears throat> but the like when life hands you lemons, and he's like, you make lemonade. And he's like, no, man. First, you manipulate everyone to believing everyone. <laughs> like, he goes into how basically you just have to manipulate everyone in the world that lemons are valuable. And that once you've done every single possible good or bad thing with this product only then do you sit back and you have lemonade i can't i'm not even going to try to do it justice because it's fantastic and and poor carl Wembley sitting there across from him just like floored again because he's just breathing the truth this is how it works this is the spin this is how you make something like and and how every people just eat it up it doesn't always work but when it does, and it, it works, I think, probably a lot more than we'd like to think. But that manipulation is just spot on. Like, finding it's airing, like, he's saying the quiet parts out loud. <laughs> Not like he's got anything to hide. He's just, he's just finally, like, he's putting it out there, like, the things that we're thinking, that we're just, and we just don't, you know, we want somebody to yell at the top of our, their lungs the things that he's saying. And I love it. Um okay, so do 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 oh and <laughs> so lemons. <laughs> that that's another thing I could have added I could have put on my instead of pointlessly mean. Um but he tries Carl tries to put the uh Carl Bumbley's character um tries to th say that well your drugs were in his system when he died. And this is where it gets to that whole ligadone isn't me. But Camille's hands grip his shoulders from behind and I, again it's a really nice creepy image of her like standing over him messed up looking and then when he gets the drink and he throws like she turns on and again she's there and that is a jump scare but still still good and when he th reacts see it it, it's, it it works as a jump scare because not only is it scary but like his reaction is realistic and it's done there for purpose it's done there to show like this man is falling apart he's he's unraveling and yet he carries on and this is where we get that backstory about uh what was going on with him and that guy i think it's like griswold or something like that which or griswold if it's griswold they just want to say it has to be an homage to vacation it has to be um but this guy's more like gordon gecko and he he basically talks about you know putting the idea man close by but that this guy <clears throat> getting him close he he wants his ideas he wants his money he wants to make more money off of this guy and he can he can get power to doing this but there's also kind of like an undercurrent of but i've got the leash so it's like at home when he's talking to his sister Played again by Willa Fitzgerald, and I, I, again, I can't believe that's her from Reacher. I just can't. It's just great. That's why I think she's probably in my thumbnail for this week. And I was going to actually put her in last week's, but Malcolm Goodwin isn't in this one, so I'm glad I waited. Um, but like her idea of like, yeah, he he's he's letting you in the door. Now you can we can figure out how to take what's ours from him. Essentially. Um. And then now we, we th then you have the setup for the Black Cat episode that happens next, which again I don't know why it's here. I kind of wish that it wasn't. Um, because I mean it's it's setting up the the conflict for his episode, but like the, his episode is going to be like pre this, right? It's going to be how like so I don't really think I need it here, but it's still effective. Again, it's it just I don't know, but. And I, I don't really even need to get into the whole, you know, what happens here. I mean, he finds that he's covered in blood. He finds a cat stab, then covers it up. Um, 
And uh, so now we they, we do get to the bit at the end, which is about Camille. Holy crap, I've been talking for a while. I think I've been talking more about this one than any of them. Um, but Camille firing her assistants because they've decided they don't want to sleep with her anymore because they're in love. And her her reaction to their them being in love, them finding each other, them having something that's, you know, real and her just tearing that, you know, they stand there respective, you know, respectfully through this whole thing, which they, I, w I wouldn't have been able to. And it, but it, the foolish part on their end was thinking that they would still have jobs. That was foolish on their part. Um, you know, they got their severance. So she tells them off and this is where we get the whole, you know, you're jealous. Yeah, but she still asks for like the the information. <laughs> now I don't know how they got the keys, but they give them to her. Uh, we quickly again, then we we set up Tamers Lane's thing, where Verna shows up now as an escort to take the place of the other escort. Who knows what happened to the original escort? Maybe she just handed her all the money she would have made that night and told her to stay home. Um, but. She comes in there and she does some improv and it's like they're looking at each other like, is this okay? And it seems like she's actually more turned on by her being improvisational and talking about like what's actually going on and actually like asking her husband how things are and how his day is and somehow her inability to like she's obviously looking for intimacy, but she's unable to actually give it, I guess. And so seeing somebody actually being intimate with her husband, and I don't mean like in sexual fashion, at least yet, it's more conversational, that gets her all, you know, twixt beneath her nethers, or whatever you want to say it, <laughs> knickers. <laughs> um, but then it's just, it's just, then it's just the end. And it's a great ending, but if it was spent more with her, you know, where you actually can follow the character a bit more, um, then this death scene is better because this is a great scene. And I, I kind of wanted to see the carnage, but I'm, I, I, there is something to be said in like a, you know, there's show don't tell, and then there's tell don't show, and I mean, we see the aftermath, so we know. We can imagine, and I think that's the point, is we get to imagine this woman. <laughs> oh, my gosh, it's terrible. But she goes to the lab, and Vern is there as a security guard. And she calls her the clever one. And when she says, you know, but you shouldn't be here, and you don't have to be here. At first, I thought, is she warning her? Is, is she not on the list? But of course she is. She dies. But was, you know, it, it's not till the end when she says, you know, look, this could have been in your bed quiet. So literally, but she's like, but here we are, right? Meaning everything's still, you're, you're who you are and I'm who I am and this is what it is and this is how it's going to happen. And I mean, we're, you know, it's better for the story. <laughs> but. It's not a warning. It meant that she's you. You were going to. You're going to die. Just, I think it's kind of funny that it was like, well, it could have been just in your sleep or something. But we're, you know, so she goes down there and she gives. We we get the again another great like monologue of about medical tr uh, tests on animals. And again, this is this show is bringing up a lot of topics. Because this is something that, you know, uh, the things that we eat and the things that we put, you know, to fix ourselves and make ourselves look pretty and blah, 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 on down the line. I don't mean to blah, 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 like I'm blowing it off, but 100 million animals a year, right, or whatever they say, or 100 million animals right now are being tested on so that we can live better lives. And how she talks about that Roderick's saving the chimps Right, we we have to save. We have to have all this conservation and keep the chimps alive because how else can we use them if they're all gone? You know, we might have to start doing human testing. Which don't even get me started. If I think I, I don't know, but and none of it was being done because they care. She's not down there at the lab to expose this 
crime. She's down there for her own benefit, for the family's benefit, not because what they're doing is wrong. And, I mean, <laughs> when she jumps up on the table and she starts moving like a monkey, I mean, Carla Gugino has always been good. I've always liked her. But, oh, my gosh, man. And every one of these, you know, whatever she's doing, man, in any of these Mike Flanagan things, boy, oh, boy. Like being the mom in, in Hill House was like this really, you liked her so much and what happens is so terrible. And you get like Gerald's Game, which I mean, based off of the Stephen King book, but still what she goes through in that, like her performance in that. Um, and in this... I mean, she's all over Flanagan stuff, but I'm just saying. Uh, when she's up there, she's screaming like a chimpanzee and like getting ready to like open her chest up. And it's like on any other day, Carlo Gugino ripping off her shirt uh, would be a great day. But like when she rips open her shirt and she's just the, the heart scar, the heart surgery scar, and you go, was this Pam? You know, probably not, but like, it, 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 then when she puts the, you know, she, she's like, you're going to, she knows she's going to die in this moment. She just goes, fuck it. I got mine. And she puts the camera up and it's, she's not there. It's a chimp. And that chimp then proceeds to kill her. And they find her the next day. Just the amount of gore on the ground and blood and, the, and her hand crawling, trying to get away. Like, led, you know. Like this woman died badly. She's standing there saying, fuck it. Right. And again, that like accepting of her fate is why I want to see, I wanted to see more of her because just having a temper tantrum uh, about her assistants quitting and the, the thing that she was talking about, like how she spins things, how she's going to spin the, uh, the death of Prospero or how she talks to Leo about how they don't make shit. That's all good, but it just, there needed to be a little bit more. There needed to give her at least five to ten more minutes of this episode. That's all I'm saying. Just to not feel like, again, I, I, it just, from a character standpoint, from a story standpoint, it just would be better, from, in my opinion. Again, this is still like a, a top-tier episode of television. But again, that's just a guy coming at it from story and character. <clears throat> and... Uh, then yeah, having the the noise over the end with the chimps, just fantastic. And I think that's about all I have to say about it. And holy crap, did I have a lot to say about it? Oh yeah, they were talking about how she was pointlessly mean. <laughs> that you're pointlessly mean at the end, like just the level of like cruelty that you just hand out for no reason. So anyway, I'm not going to be pointlessly mean any further, and I'm going to end this. But. I get ready for episode four. Hopefully I'll have that in the next couple of days. Uh, I have to record when I can record and it's not very often. So sometimes you'll see one video and you might see three or four in one day, you know, so uh, look out for more content and don't forget to like and subscribe and all that jazz. And I'll see y'all on the next one. Bye.